Fewer than 170,000 people lived on the island of Manhattan in 1825. By any modern standard, the largest city in America was still a relatively peaceful place, compact, orderly, and even rural. Just two miles from where the Dutch had landed two centuries before, the closely knit town tapered off into a wilderness of farms, country lanes, and open fields. George Templeton Strong, a native New Yorker born as work on the Erie Canal began, could easily walk from his father's house down near the battery, up to the old pear tree Peter Stuyvesant had planted on the outskirts of town. Across the river, in the village of Brooklyn, population 11,000, Long Island-born Walt Whitman loved to play baseball in the vacant fields that surrounded the sleepy town. Life in both cities was still strikingly simple. There was no regular police force, no professional fire department, no public transportation, only the most primitive water and sewage systems, and just a handful of public schools. At night, flickering gas lamps, introduced only two years before, scarcely lit the poorly paved streets, which after sundown were nearly deserted. It was confined to extremely lower Manhattan. My great-great-great-grandfather, um, who wrote a memoir of his childhood in the first decade of the 19th century, um, remembered that all above Grand Street was country. I mean, City Hall was his father, actually. My foregreats grandfather was a, was a city alderman. He was the one who found the compromise to get City Hall finished. It had been under construction for 10 years, and it was lying there unfinished because it was so expensive. He said, let's finish the back of City Hall with brownstone instead of with marble, because it's so far uptown, nobody will ever see the back of it anyway. Never again would life in New York City be so simple or harmonious. In the decades to come, forces that had been gathering for 200 years would converge on the island of Manhattan, transforming every aspect of life in the city and bringing every possibility and every problem of the modern age. All American cities uh, were experiencing revolutionary change in terms of the way people lived. But in New York, it was on a more intense level because the size of the city, the narrowness of the geography, the intensity and extremeness of the growth was so much greater than other places. New York had only 100,000 people in 1800. By 1900, it had 50 times as many people. That's an incredible transformation. No city in America had ever grown so rapidly or so large. No city on Earth had ever brought so many different kinds of people together in one place at one time. Between 1825 and 1865, New Yorkers would confront the most daunting question of their entire history. Could they create a new kind of order on the island of Manhattan? Or would the city explode into chaos and violence and subside into complete anarchy? We are rapidly becoming the London of America. I myself am astonished, and this city is the wonder of every stranger. John Pintard. Its advantages of position are perhaps unequaled anywhere. Situated on an island, which I think it will one day cover, it rises like Venice from the sea. And like that fairest of cities in the days of her glory, receives into its lap tribute of all the riches of the earth, Francis Trollope. From the day it opened in October 1825, the Erie Canal sparked an economic revolution that would transform forever life in New York City. 
Connecting the Great Lakes to the Hudson River and beyond, it transformed New York almost overnight into a gigantic funnel through which much of the wealth of the Western world would now have to pass. By the Erie Canal, New York effectively captured the economy of the Middle West, and it began to grow so extraordinarily quickly. It developed around 10 miles of street front per year in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. I mean, it was just one gigantic construction zone. And once it starts, it begins to snowball. I mean, it's like a planetesimals building up into a planet. Once it gets enough gravity, it sucks in everything else. And that's what happened in New York, because New York was the largest city in the census. And then the larger it got, the larger it tended to go on. The canal changes everything. After that, New York would be out in front and would never look back. So in culture, uh, in the economy, in, in spurring industrialization, because now you've got a market for cast iron mass manufactured goods because they can go out, the ramifications are absolutely total uh, in, in, in all areas. By 1830, people were pouring into Manhattan to work in the new factories, offices, and workshops of the city. As commercial activity in Lower Manhattan exploded, the narrow lanes of the old Dutch village were transformed into the first district in the world devoted exclusively to commerce. So in New York City, almost for the first time in human history, you get an area that's just business and people don't live there. You have to come there from somewhere else. So it's a breaking up, it's a transformation of the historic city. The people with money begin to move away, the journey to work begins to increase. We have a different kind of a place, and New York City is at the forefront of that. We don't think about New York as an industrial city, really. We think Detroit, we think you know, Chicago, whatever. Uh, but in fact, by the time of the Civil War, New York was the biggest industrial city in the United States. What we have, in fact, is a kind of a metropolitan industrialization. It's small scale, there are little shops, most factories, so-called, are maybe 20 people large, and there's hundreds of them, there's thousands of them, and they're in incredible, intense competition with one another. With astonishing speed, the outlines of a modern mass metropolis were beginning to appear on the island of Manhattan including the first slums and suburbs, the first modern police force, the first public transit system, the first department stores, and a vast new waterworks, the massive Croton Aqueduct, on the outskirts of town. By 1840, New York was moving into uncharted territory, no longer merely a port, but a giant vortex, drawing everything in America into its orbit. Goods, money, people, ideas, and increasingly, tensions. For better and for worse, one man wrote, New York is fast becoming, if she be not already, America. Before some point, I think my own sense of it is that somewhere in the 1820s and 30s, one could feel that they could grasp the whole of New York. Uh, after that point, it became too complicated for people to have that kind of confidence. That's the difference between pre-modern New York and modern New York. It is a place of multiple realities and partial comprehensions, hopefully enough comprehension so that one doesn't go around lost and disoriented all the time. But I think it would be a far less interesting experience if one thought one really comprehended it.